Jesus Christ is near. Appreciate the songs that Josh picked out this morning. They all had to do with the glory of God, with worshiping God, singing hallelujah, the, 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 the uh, beautiful, uh, wonderful, powerful name of our Savior. Because you see, whether you recognize it or not, that's, that's what has spur, spawned, uh, spurred on the Apostle Paul to write what he's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Would remind you before we read that passage together that, that in 1 Corinthians 5, when he turned a little bit from dealing with their divisiveness in Corinth, began to take on a very serious problem of immorality that they were basically winking at, that he has continued to think about how, how immorality is so contrary to the gospel that it, that it undermines the gospel, that it cuts the nerve of the gospel, that it dulls the gospel. And he's still thinking about that in chapter 7 uh, as he's come through 6 to speak about how they're not relating as, as they should before the world and then talking about how they, when they come to know Christ, when we come to know Christ, we no longer can say we are our own. Let me tell you something. Every decision we make will be held accountable for before God. If we claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. And so he still has that in his mind when he comes to what we call chapter 7, where he's talking about how they, how marriage has been undermined in Corinth, how people have wrong notions about what it means to follow Christ. There's two ditches, remember? One is the ditch of, of licentiousness, which says, well, we're in Christ. It doesn't matter how we live. The other ditch is a, is a, is a hardcore legalistic fundamentalism which says, well, now, because we're in Christ, uh, we, need to stop, we need to stop the pleasure. No more pleasure. Pleasure's gone. Find your pleasure in Christ. Grow up. And Paul says both of those are wrong. They're, they're antithetical to the gospel. They do not represent the Savior who lived and died and rose again and came that we might have life and have it abundantly, but find it in him first and foremost. So I want you to see today as we're looking at the, the second installment, second consideration of this topic in seven, chapter 7, verses 1 to 16, marriage, immorality, and the gospel. Stand with me if you would. I hope you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put the text on the screen, but we really want you to have your own copy of the Scripture. You can't pack these screens out of here with you. You can't take our computers out of here with you to have the text. I want you to have your copy of Scripture so you can look at it and gaze upon it and read it for yourselves. Follow along as I, as I read. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote... It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to the husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as myself, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And, and we need 
help today. When we live in a culture where the whole idea of marriage, of the idea of one man, one woman joined in a one flesh relationship for all of life is disintegrating right before our very eyes. And all sorts of perversion are rising up to fill the gap, or I would say are coming out like, like ghosts, like specters, like, like uh, goblins out of Pandora's box, which has been opened in this culture. And if not checked by gospel believers who carry the gospel into the world, uh, will ultimately be the downfall of this nation. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, as I said in chapter 6, Paul has said, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the Lord. He carries that theme over when he says your body, if you're married, if you're a believer and you're, you're married, your body not only belongs to the Lord and doesn't belong to you, your body belongs to your spouse. And we looked at that a little bit last week. What I want to do is, is address the rest of this passage. They will touch, touch briefly on what we discussed last week then address the rest of this passage to help us better understand living life married before the Lord in a nation that despises marriage. The context, the cultural context in which Paul is writing this, uh, there was this, this a certain group of folks, sort of an ascetic, if you know what that word means, uh, the touch not, taste not, the remove your world, uh, back away from the world. The, the, you would see it in a monastic mentality today of, in monasteries, uh, in the, uh, the so-called alleged priestly celibacy in the Catholic Church, this idea that, that uh, celibacy was preferred to marriage. And I want to say to folks when I encounter people like that, uh, you ought to thank God your parents didn't believe that. Or you wouldn't be here. And apparently in the Corinthian church, some shared this view. And we believe, as I said to you last week, when you, when you open up this passage, that he's, the first thing he says is a quote. He's about the matter you wrote to me about. And he quotes, we believe, back to them that it's good for man not to. Not to touch a woman. Good for a man not to be married. And so Paul is responding to that biblically. Remember, the gospel is at stake. If we mouth the gospel when we're together, we will go out and live in, a, in, the, in the community, in the world around us, as if we do not know the gospel. We, we harm the gospel. We set up a situation where people say, I. Ah, the church is no different from us. I don't want to hear their message. What do they got to offer me? Well, in the gospel, which is a perfect message about a perfect Savior who came to die for imperfect people, there's a great word we have. In a broken world where people have lost their way so much that they can't even look themselves in the mirror, some of them, and admit how God made them. They want to change that. And so here we come with a message. And it appears, and I told you this last week, my, my Greek professor in seminary, Dr. Curtis Vaughn, wrote an excellent, what we call a digest, not a full-blown commentary, but an di excellent digest on 1 Corinthians. And he said the questions that occur here, it seems to him, is it permissible for Christians to marry and are married couples to continue normal sexual relations after becoming Christians? So we looked at, we opened up five headings to you last week. First, marriage is not mandatory, but it is the normative standard. Second, marriage involves physical obligations binding on both husband and wife. Third, marriage and the gift of celibacy. Fourth, the question is, is divorce between believers permissible? And fifth question, is divorce between a believer and an unbeliever permissible? That's where we're headed today is number four and number five. But real quickly, real quickly, let's just touch on these first three. Marriage is not mandatory, but it's, it's the normative standard. You can remain single. You're not an, in, you're not an, an incomplete person if you're single. I know some precious people uh, who have, have never married. They're, they're full-grown adults. They're engaged in, in serving the Lord through the local church, their blessings. 
They don't have some of the responsibilities that, that married people have. So they're not incomplete. And I think that's some, there, was a, there was a time, I think that's shifting in this culture. There was a time when folks would look at a, at a young woman and go, well, why aren't you married by now? When are you going to get married? That's a wrong attitude. That, that undermines that person as, a, as someone made in the image of God, an image bearer of God's, God's glory. There was a time when a man that would grew into adulthood and wasn't married, the folks would go, hmm, what's going on here? What's wrong? That's wrong. So marriage is not mandatory, but mandatory, but marriage is God's normative standard, Genesis 2. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And if Adam and Eve had not followed that model, none of us would be here. And Paul's not here discussing the full compass of, of matters about marriage, about why marry, to, to procreate, uh, advance the human race, and other reasons. He's not doing that here. He's, remember, he's thinking about immorality in the church at Corinth and wrong responses to it which undermine the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the second thing that we touched on last last week was that marriage involves physical obligations binding on both husbands and wife. You back up a minute to chapter 5. What was going on in the life of that young man? What was going on in the life of that of that woman who was either his biological mother or his stepmother, his husband's wife as Paul describes it? What was happening in their lives that that opened the door for them to have an immoral relationship. Something was wrong. Perhaps this man's father was not caring for his wife in terms of her physical needs of intimacy. Perhaps this man misunderstood, this young man misunderstood the, the whole relationship of, of being celibate and single before the Lord until the Lord brings the right woman. There was something wrong, in other words. And that's, what, that's operating in, Paul's, in the back of Paul's mind. Something led, by the way, something always leads to immorality. You don't fall in love, you don't fall out of love. You fall into a hole. You fall out of a car, maybe. Something led to this. And so Paul's addressing these two ditches. The, the one in Corinth that was basically saying, well, you know, I grew up in Corinth visiting the temple prostitutes as, as what we were taught was worship of our gods, engaging in immorality with them in the name of worshiping. I grew up in this culture. A man might say that. A woman might say, well, I grew up as one of these women servicing the men. And now that I've turned my back on this culture and I've turned to become a follower of Jesus Christ, I need to reject all of that evil. What was happening in the society at Corinth was exceedingly wicked. But it wasn't because the act of intimacy in itself is wicked. It was where it was being uh, conducted, the context in which it was undertaken. And so Paul is trying to deal with them and say, it's, it's a, if, you're, if you've been taught at Corinth that abstaining from evil means abstaining from marriage, if that's, if that's your conclusion, you're wrong. You're not thinking right. If you've been taught that because you are a spiritual being made in the image of God and that your highest devotion should be to God and that heaven is going to be a glorious place where there's neither marrying nor given in marriage and you conclude from that that therefore I should not carry on as a married man with my wife now that I'm in Christ. I should not carry on as a married woman with my husband now that I'm in Christ. Paul says you're thinking wrong on this. Because not only does your body not belong to you but belongs to God but God would say if you're married, you're to become one flesh. Therefore, you don't control your body anymore as a married man. It belongs to your wife. And you don't control your body anymore as a married woman. It belongs to your husband. 
And Paul has in mind here, in order not to set up a scenario where, where, where withholding and stiff-arming will lead a person into temptation that they cannot fight successfully, and they f then find themselves engaging in immorality. That's, the re that's what's going on here. That's the rationale that's happening here. And so he did teach, we pointed this out last week, that it's the idea of one man, one, one woman. There's, there's no thought for Paul that you can go anywhere from that. One man, one woman joined in a one flesh relationship for all of life. Now, that was, that was radical in that culture. In fact, it was radical in some of the Hebrew culture where, the, where, they, where they took on more than one wife. It is still a radical notion today in cultures around the world and even some subcultures in our country where they, where they take on multiple wives. One man, one woman joined in a one flesh relationship throughout the journey. So, that was the second thing we looked at last week. The third thing was this, that there is a gift of celibacy. Paul, Paul says in verses 6 and 9, he says, is this not a command? Jesus didn't teach this either in his time on earth or when, he, when, when I was schooled by the Holy Spirit. I wish you could be like me. Paul, somewhere along the way, as a Pharisee who, as a Pharisee, had to be married had to have one, at least one male child. Somewhere along the way, where they probably, I told you last week, probably had a funeral for Paul when he, when he turned to Christ, away from Judaism, and, and had, a, had a basic burial for him, as if he was no longer. And so Paul has been enabled, he's been given this gift of celibacy, he says, but each has his own gift from God. And he basically says, I've had the gift of celibacy. To remain single. Which meant that he didn't have to make decisions about advancing the gospel with wondering what, what's, this, what's the impact of this, the implication of this on my, my wife and family, which a married person must do. So there is a gift of celibacy. And if a person has it, God bless you. If you've been wired in such a way and the Spirit's come upon you in such a way that you can withstand the temptation to immorality, and be single and focused, then, then the church ought to harness that and say sick them to that person and engage them in ministry because they can minister unfettered. But not everybody has that. So he says in that passage, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Let me say parenthetically, Paul is not saying here that because of that truth that a preacher is obligated to marry anyone. People who are not being married in the Lord don't have the right to come and say to a preacher, you've got to marry me. We want to get married. And by the way, that's happening in this culture. Folks, folks are being sued. Churches are being sued. Pastors are being sued. I found in violation of civil rights when they say, I can't do it. You see, because marriage can take place civilly. That's what the justice of the peace is for. They... The, the principle here is if you can't control your passions and your only alternative is to, to be engaged in immorality, whether it's monogamous immorality or serial immorality, then it's better to marry. You ought to go ahead and get married. And I would, I've said to people through the years, yeah, well, I want to commend you to the justice of the peace. I can't, I can't perform your, your marriage. I want to, best I can, bring two people together in the Lord. I had a couple come to me years ago and and she was pregnant out of wedlock, a sweet little girl. And, and so I'm sitting there talking. And they said, uh, she was from a Mormon background. She said, uh, we want to get, uh, get married in the church. I said, why? What's the necessity? You, you're pretty young. I said, uh, is there something happening in, in your life that, that it means you have to get married? Well, I said, like, are you pregnant? Well, yes, I am. I said, okay. Oh, no, he said, kind of. That's what his kind of. I said, no, you're not kind of pregnant. Pregnant's one of those things that either you are or you're not. I said, but what, what do you, he said, well, we want God to bless our union. I said, well, getting married in a building called a church is not going to bless your union. So I said, I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to sit down and counsel with you. I want to work through some things with you. Well, they want to get married right then. So I sent them on to the justice of the peace. Better to marry than to burn with passion, although I think they were, they were already beyond the burn with passion stage. 
So Paul's not saying that therefore, because a couple can't maintain their, subdue their passions and need to get married, that therefore the preacher's got to marry them. That's not what's being taught here and that needs to be understood. So now, the fourth consideration, is divorce between believers permissible? So he says this in verses 10 to 11. To the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. So he's, he is citing the teachings of Jesus here. The wife should not separate from her husband. And then he parenthetically, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And then the husband should not divorce his wife. Again, this is radical in that culture. Because in that culture, a woman didn't have a say in anything. She was basically, whether it was a pagan culture, whether it was a Jewish culture, she was basically at the whim of her husband. And you, you may have read accounts, heard about them in, the, in Judaism, where if a, if, a, if a wife burned the meal, he could divorce her. Just like that. Now, my wife's a wonderful cook and has fed me faithfully for 43 years. But I've eaten my share of burned French bread and burned toast. So years ago, I just decided to do it myself. My wife adores me. How do I know that? Because she offers me burnt offerings on an occasional basis. And that's, that's, how, that's how I've managed to handle it in my heart. Uh, so we're not talking. He, he's saying something that was totally radical to the culture. You don't just divorce at the drop of a hat. Well, I don't love you anymore. Well, if you would love Jesus, <laughs> you, could love, you could love your spouse if you love Jesus uh, and uh, find a way to do that. So the question is, is it permissible? That's apparently something that was asked because the mentality, remember, was it doesn't matter what you do with your body because you're a spiritual being in Christ. The other was it matters. Everything matters. Nothing that needs to be more important than, than a relationship with God through Christ. Therefore, all these other things, these physical things, need to pass away. If you're, if you're a real Christian, follow this, then you will do away with that. Well, okay, again, if you have the gift of celibacy, God bless you. But if you're a married person, that's not an option. And so he is speaking now to believers. He does not take into account, remember, because what is his purpose? His purpose is to address the immorality in the church at Corinth, which is undermining the power of the gospel. He doesn't take into a question all that Jesus taught. In fact, some have suggested that, that because uh, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians before any of the gospel accounts were written down, that maybe the Jesus, what we call Jesus' exception observations, were not in play here. But listen to this. What did Jesus teach? Just give you a sampling. Matthew 5, 32. I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. It's interesting, isn't it? So, if there's sexual immorality involved, then divorce is permissible. But if it's not, then you have, you have played your hand, husband, into putting your wife into the category of an adulteress. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. 19.9, Matthew. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So it's, it's not just that the husband is doing this to the wife. He's doing this to himself. And then Mark 10.9. Whoever, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And then Luke 16.18. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. I'm not going to go through and unpack all this. I've already preached on this in recent times in terms of, of, of the, uh, what the scriptures teach and bringing into all the implications of what we call the grounds for divorce. And if you're sitting here today and you're thinking, well, wow, pastor, based on that, I'm committing adultery. The gospel overcomes all this, folks. The divorce is not the unpardonable sin. I said that back then. I say it again today. There's no indication in the scripture that having had a divorce makes you unsavable. I know preachers that act like that, but that's just not, the, that's not the, the warp and woof of the Scriptures. What Paul is talking about here is do not treat marriage lightly in the name of having come to know Christ. If 
you can imagine this, in Corinth there seemed to be people who said, well, I'm married. I, I, I need to belong. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the air of time alone, but for eternity. I need to be totally devoted to Jesus, so I'm going to divorce you. And she says, well, I'm, I'm devoted to Jesus too. Can we be devoted together? <laughs> it's a wrong thinking about what it means to follow Christ. And so you have this, this teaching that Paul says is, is authoritative, and he, there are passages where Jesus has taught this, but it's not everything that Jesus taught, and Paul is not giving his uh, full discussion on the nature of marriage here. He's talking about how the gospel is undermined when people come to Christ in a pagan culture and then make wrong applications of what that means in the context of marriage. And I've sat across from people who've looked at me and said, I'm leaving my husband. They have no biblical grounds. And I'm going to marry this fellow here, and God has given me a peace about it. And Paul would say, that is not possible. God gives no peace by pursuing something contrary to his revealed will. And so you have that consideration on, on two believers. And the answer is, if you want the gospel to be magnified, if you want Jesus to be glorified, if you want the power of the cross to be manifested and his power to reconcile Jew and Gentile and a husband and a wife who are at odds with one another, then you, then you fight the fight of faith to save this relationship called marriage that's designed, as he says in Ephesians 5, to reflect the relationship of Christ to the church. You fight for it. There's a song, love's worth fighting for. You fight for it. Too many people give up too, too quickly. And I'm not saying they should ever be divorced. You know, you know me better than that. I'm saying that for, what we're talking about here for Paul, don't give up. Fight it through. Fight it through. And then the last thing in this passage is, is divorce between a believer and an unbeliever permissible. See, it's, there's a lot of things happening in Corinth. Two people come out of the Corinthian culture. They're married. They come to know Christ. They were married before they came to know Christ. Paul says this, to the rest I say, I, not the Lord. By the way, he's not saying that this is not authoritative. What he's saying is I'm, I can't cite the teachings of Jesus on this. Paul was taught by the Holy Spirit in the Arabian desert for about three years when he had his Judaism turned completely on its head and he came out embracing justification by faith alone and the finished work of Christ alone. So he says, I, not the Lord, that if any brother, speaking to a believer here, has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. Don't draw the wrong conclusion that, oh my goodness, I'm married to someone who's not a follower of Christ. I don't have any business being married to a person not a follower of Christ. Paul said that's wrong thinking. If, if, if the woman says, I'm willing to live with you, I'm willing for the marriage to continue. 13, if any woman has a husband who's an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. I don't believe you can appreciate how radical this is. Paul has, by the, for the gospel's sake, put man and woman on equal footing in Christ. That was unheard of in this culture. And he gives his reasoning here. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. This is a, this is a very challenging passage because this is one of the passages that our friends uh, who, uh, who we love otherwise and, and, and rally around the gospel who draw the conclusion from this that this is why you, this is why you sprinkle infants for this passage. And I love them. I've talked with them. I want to say, why don't you sprinkle the unbelieving spouse? That's what it's all about. If an unbelieving husband is 
sanctified by, the, by being in a union, a marital union with a believing wife, why don't you sprinkle the husband? And vice versa. Now, Paul, if you, if you study Paul's use of this, this word grouping of sanctification, it's, it's a hagiadzo is the, is the word, and so we get holy from it and sanctified, sanctified. He uses this almost exclusively of growing in grace, believers growing in grace. Now, if you take that application of it, then what he's saying is that there's salvation by proxy. That, that the fact that a person is married to a woman who's a believer or a person is married to a man who's a believer, that that unbelieving person somehow has some inside track, that they may, they may get a little heaven. They may get heaven in a corner. They may... That can't be what he's talking about in terms of the warp and woof of Paul's teaching. He makes it very plain. He's just said in the previous chapters. There's this list of people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he doesn't say in there unless they happen to be married to a believer. What he's talking about here is not, not saving sanctification or sanctification that results from being saved. He's talking about the, the, the gospel influence. That if a, if a husband and a, and a wife, if they were married, as unbelievers, and one of them comes to know Christ, that they are a gospel influence. There's gospel light. Remove yourself from that situation, and you take the light of the gospel out of it. And you can wreck your children. Because you've got to explain to these children as they grow up. Now, t- tell me this, mom or dad. You, you were saved, and you left daddy, you left mom because she wasn't saved. Where was the power of the gospel in that? So he's dealing with this here, and he goes on and says, but, verse 15, if the unbelieving partner separates, in other words, if it's the, if it's the unbeliever who says, look, I, didn't buy, I did not marry a Jesus nut. And I don't know what's happened to you, but you're not the person I married. I want nothing to do with this. If that person, the unbeliever, leaves the relationship, then Paul says, let it be so. If they don't want to live with you because you follow Jesus Christ, in such cases, the brother or sister, again, he's keeping them on equal footing that blows me away when I read this. This was so unusual. The brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. So he basically says, you're not, you're not bound by what I said earlier that you either have to live, live single or be reconciled that does not apply when an unbeliever leaves a believer. God's called you to peace. He said, you don't have time on this earth to fight, to win back the unbeliever and go through all the headache and the horror that's going to happen. That's his teaching on this. And then he adds further, for how do you know? How do you know that by doing that, wife, if you will save your husband? How do you know by doing, by fighting for it with a person, that, an unbeliever who doesn't want to continue the marriage, that you will save your wife? It's, what's, he, what's he said here? Do you, he has said the gospel is to be preeminent. When I, here, follow me now before we write this up. When I think about getting married, I need to marry in the Lord. If I marry for lust, if I marry for, quote, happiness, I have no footing. You see, we make this huge mistake. People ruin their lives and then come with their, with their relationships in a basket of 10 million pieces and say, I want God to bless this. Well, you know, he can. The gospel is that powerful. But why weren't you thinking about the blessing of God when you entered this? That's what he's warning them in Corinth. Think gospel. Put on gospel lenses and ask yourself, if I'm married to a person who's a, who's a believer, Can't we then magnify the glory of God and the gospel by living together and loving one another? Isn't my my greatest challenge in this relationship, in this little mission field, is to, as as a husband, is to be sure that my wife delights in the Lord? Isn't my greatest challenge as as, as a wife that that my husband delights, that I am am the joy of his life, that I'm not making him miserable, but I'm blessing him? I'm not making her miserable, but I'm, I'm blessing her. But if I'm living, living with an unbeliever, 
What should I do? If the unbeliever is willing to stay, then, then pray, dear God, the light of the glory of God in the gospel will, will beam in this home and that every member of this household will come to know Jesus Christ. That's the goal. That's the challenge. And Corinth had it all wrong. So, in conclusion, if you're married to a believer, rejoice and make the most of it. And be sure, husband, that you give yourself to your wife, that you, you're, you're honest and bold enough to ask her from time to time, how am I doing? Because the first thing is, oh, you're, you're wonderful. Okay, good. thanks for that. How am I doing? <laughs> how could I, how, what, what do I need to do to love you well? Wife, you need the same thing. Ask your husband, how am I doing? What do I need to do to love you well? And then if you're married to an unbeliever, you love that spouse so wonderfully that they see the transformation. You know, when, when, we were, when we, neither one of us were saved, we had this kind of marriage. But I've noticed that now that my spouse has come to Christ, I'm amazed at how he loves. I'm amazed at how she respects it's a, the transformation is shocking. There's got to be something to this gospel. That's the challenge. But he's giving because it is all about the gospel. And I promise you this, the moment I make marriage about me is the, is the moment that it begins to unravel. But if I can keep making marriage about, about the Lord and about my wife, then it'll be okay. It's going to be better than okay. 43 years now, God has blessed us. I don't know if people are staggered, amazed that she's hung in there 43 years. 43 years. And there's some ways in which it gets better and better. Remember the triangle. The closer you get to God, your devotion to God, you and your spouse can be here. If one's moving and that one's not, well, the disparity can be challenging. But the closer you draw to God in Christ, and the closer that your spouse draws to God in Christ, look what heaven, you're growing closer and closer to one another. And that's Paul's desire for the folks in Corinth, that that pagan culture that is so empty, that consumes lust, and yet they never feel, they never satisfy, will look and see a subculture there called Christ followers and say they have something I don't have. I need to ask them what the reason is for the hope that is in them. Christ crucified and risen makes all the difference. Receiving the gospel makes all the difference. Living the gospel makes all the difference. And it impacts a world that somehow strangely thinks to encourage a four-year-old boy, that he really is a girl, and it's okay to pursue that. The gospel has an impact that says, stop that nonsense. God made us male, female, made us male and female. Fulfill who God made you to be through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the gospel, isn't it? Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, forgive us when we make life and we make decisions that are not based on how, how can I glorify God in this? How can I advance the gospel of Christ in this? How can I be a blessing? Forgive me, Lord, when I make decisions, how can I be blessed? How, how will blessing accrue to me? Forgive me. Help us to think in terms of you being the, the blessed God of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has blessed us that we might be a blessing to others. And in particular, as we're looking at today, that that will happen in our homes. That neighbors around us who are struggling, who are frustrated, whose lives are falling apart, who, who, whose hopes and dreams are shattered, will be able to look at us, not because we've just got big smiles on our face and we're doing just great without any problems, but because we have an anchor for our souls in Jesus Christ who carries us through 
life's greatest storms. Teach us that. Help us to live it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.